Hey guys, uh, today I want to cover a subject that I, I get asked probably more than anything really um, is people when they get new hatchling snakes asking how do you tame them down or how do you get them accustomed to handling. Uh, this video is going to be geared more towards the bloods and short tails just because that's what I have the most experience in dealing with as, as babies. Uh, so some of this can apply to other species. Some you have to tailor a little bit more to, to the natural uh, you know, habits and instincts and things of that particular species. Bloods and short tails are largely terrestrial snakes. Uh, that means that they stay on the ground most of the time. That's where they're the most comfortable. Uh, so anytime that we're handling them, we're holding them up in the air and that automatically is gonna put them into a situation where they may be uncomfortable. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. So a lot of people's instinct, they don't wanna get bit. They often hold them away from their body. That can be a mistake. Keeping them in closer to your body keeps them closer to a structure where they feel like there's not so much exposure. Um, also, like anything else, giving them a little bit of freedom of movement rather than being overly restrictive can help as well. Uh, but what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about what people do and then show you some examples of some ways to work with some animals. So I have four different animals here. Uh, I've got a Sumatran short tail. I think I have two Borneo short tails and then a, a blood python for you, all that hatched in 2019. Uh, so one thing that people will say all the time, you go into groups and people will ask this question, you know, all the time. So I'm sure you've all seen a lot of it. You'll see people talking about, oh, you know, you just got to take the bites and you got to keep handling them and keep handling them until they don't want to bite anymore. And that can work. Uh, that's a technique that most people will call flooding. And basically what you're doing is breaking the animal's will down. Uh, you're just letting it bite and bite and bite and be stressed and um, until the point where it just basically gives up and rolls over and says, kill me. Uh, and that to me is not really the best way to build a lasting relationship with your animals. Uh, to me, you know, I wanna have a working relationship with them and I don't want people to misunderstand relationship and, and think, you know, they love me, I love them, I love them, they don't care if I live or die. Uh, and that's something that we just have to accept. To me, that's a, a positive of keeping reptiles. I like that we have to work harder to build those relationships. Um, but I know some people have a need to feel like the animal loves them. These guys just aren't capable of those complex emotions. Uh, so that also means that when a snake's biting you or striking at you, they're doing it for one of two reasons. Either they feel the need to defend themselves or they're confusing you with a food source. So the first thing to do when dealing with them is to figure out what's causing them to strike at you. Are they striking at you because they think you're food or are they striking at you because uh, they're scared. So learning animal behavior, of course, is a big part of that and being able to recognize the body language, the type of strike, the tongue flicks, all these things that tell us, okay, this is what the animal is thinking because the animal is going to strike at food in a different manner than it's going to strike defensively, typically. Uh, some species can look fairly similar, but typically there's, there's difference. Uh, so you want to identify that first. If food is the issue, then all you need to do is figure out how to help that animal understand that you're not food. That can be simply, you know, tapping them on the nose with some paper towels. And when I say tap, I literally mean just touching it. One nice thing is if they do bite this, you can just let them have it for a minute and, you know, make sure that their teeth get out of there comfortably, but it shouldn't hurt them as long as you don't jerk it away or anything. Uh, you know, some people use hooks. There's a little tiny hook here. They make much larger ones, obviously. I don't use hooks a lot in general. I do with my olive pythons. I do with, uh, you know, one or two other snakes that I feel just respond to it well. I like to have my hands on the animals. That's when I can feel their intentions the best. That's where I feel like they can feel that I'm confident the best. Excuse me, whenever I talk, I get indigestion or something. Uh, so basically, once you realize that, you know, it's defensive behavior, uh, that's where this video will really come in into play. And so, you know, as an example, I've got, uh, you know, the Sumatran short tail python here. So I'm going to turn the camera down so you can see these guys here. And let me uh, get in the sunlight, turn this around so you can see the snake. Now, Suma these Sumatran short tails are really laid back. So there's really not much technique with these guys. You just reach in, pick them up, and uh, you know, about a week old, by then these guys are that way. They're just really easy. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't strike at you or, or won't bite, but typically they're just laid back. And until they actually see food in front of their face, 
they're not as likely to offer a food response, at least at this age. As they get older, they get more and more intense with their food response in most cases. So with this snake, there's really not much technique to it. I just reach in, pick it up, and, and there we are. But not all of them are like that. So one thing you can do if you have an overly defensive snake, you wanna have positive interactions. You don't wanna ever get to that point where you're having negative interaction because it can take a long time for a snake to calm down, but it can take a minute or two or one mistake to really set yourself back. So one thing that I do, if you notice, is I'm not reaching at his face. I'm coming in from about his midsection to a little bit above. Uh, you know, that's an area where I can grab him from. He knows that I consistently grab there. So he knows that that's me, it's not a food source. You know, they do learn that routine to a certain extent. I'm not presenting myself as a food or a threat because a food or a threat typically is gonna come in directly at their face. Uh, predator wants to uh, go after the most dangerous part of the body to them. And the same thing when they're going after prey, they wanna go after the, you know, the prey square on. So that's what they're waiting for. Now these snakes can strike in any position. So this snake could easily bite my thumb right now. Uh, that is one of the things that bloods and short tails do really well is they're very, very athletic snakes, which I know a lot of people are surprised by that because of their structure, but they're incredibly athletic. They're like loaded springs. Uh, their strike range is further than most snakes similar in size. A lot of snakes similar in size, especially as adults are gonna strike about a third to half their body length. These guys can literally throw their entire body at you. And if you really agitate them, they will. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind when working with them. But one of the things that I do is if you have a snake that's more defensive, you don't have to just go in and pick it right up. You can start small. You can just have the snake here in the tub or cage or whatever it's in. Um, and you can just sit here and do a normal activity. You can read a book. You can sing to the snake, talk to the snake. And talking is one of those things that will actually help out. Uh, and not because the snake hears you or it does anything for, for them in that sense. But what happens is when you're focused on what you're saying and you're focused on speaking, you're not thinking about the fact that the animal's making you nervous. You're thinking about the fact that, oh, what am I going to say next? What am I singing? Where's the pitch? Whatever it is. So that presents more confidence without you even realizing it. So you're essentially tricking yourself. Uh, so another thing that you can do is if you have a nervous animal, once you get, do this for a while and you start to see the body language is, is more suggestive of the fact that the snake's okay with you coming into its space, you can just start with some gentle petting like that and see how the animal reacts. If the animal's immediate reaction is to strike or to head at you, back off and slow down a little bit. If the animal's just giving you, like you can see this animal's tongue flicks and he's just curious as to what's going on, you know, then you can continue to pet him lightly. Uh, even, you know, just move his body a little bit in the tub. You know, nothing too crazy, but just enough to let the animal learn that, okay, you know, here we are interacting, I'm not getting hurt. And over time, the animals start to learn like, okay, this, this person or this creature, whatever they think of us as, doesn't mean me any harm, they're just coming in here or whatever. And so they eliminate you as a food source, they eliminate you as a threat. And you can see now that I picked the snake up, the tongue flicks have increased, you know, it's a little more alert to what's going on and trying to assess the situation. So it's still a young animal, and so it hasn't been handled a lot. I've probably handled this animal, you know, outside of cleaning its cage two or three times. Uh, like I said, these guys just tend to be more calm. But you can see that, you know, he's very alert. He's trying to figure out, okay, here's my hand. It's warm. Is this a food source? Um, you know, these guys will explore and check it out and, uh, you know, see what's going on. That's pretty normal. So let me show you some other snakes. You know, this guy being... The, the least defensive baby far and away, obviously. Now you could have a situation where you have an animal like this blood python here that's in some substrate. You know, he's in, in sphagnum moss, which I need to damp down again. Um, but now you're coming into a space where you can't really see where the animal is established. One thing I like to do is if you pick up the tub, and I won't really be able to do this well, um, but you can see underneath in the tub and you can see where the animal is and try to figure out, you know, what direction the head's pointed in so that you're not gonna be coming in as a threat. Then I like to uncover the animal so that they can see, you know, see me coming. And then, you know, some gentle touching to let them know, okay, something's in here with me. And you can see his posture and he's just trying to get away. So he doesn't have any interest necessarily in striking, but he is nervous. Um, so now I'm gonna get him out and he's gonna be a little herky-jerky for a minute and try to figure out what's going on. Why was I just in my, you know, nice moss and all of a sudden here I am exposed. 
So you wanna keep them supported, as I mentioned, that's really important to these guys is feeling secure uh, so that they don't have to be nervous that they're gonna fall. But you can see this snake has much more rapid tongue flicks than the other. Um, he's still very nervous. Uh, once again, I haven't handled these babies a whole lot. I like to let babies kind of just uh, be babies for a while. You know, obviously take them out to care for them and clean their cage and all that. But I like to be minimally intrusive for like the first six months of their life or so. Uh, just something that I have personal preference with. Obviously, if you have a pet, you'll probably be handling them from an earlier age. Uh, this guy was a slow starter eating, so I wanted to wait until he was taking food consistently. But you can see already he's calming down a little bit. The tongue flicks aren't as rapid. Uh, he's a little bit more in a, in a curious state of mind than nervous. Uh, he hasn't completely eliminated being nervous, but he's not as nervous as he was initially. Uh, and so over time, when we have these positive interactions and he realizes that, hey, you know, this guy had me out. He took me out of my comfortable hiding place, but he didn't do anything bad to me. They'll start to learn that that's okay. Um, and then, you know, you'll see when I put him back, he'll probably want to go right down into his moss um, and just get into where he's comfortable. So you can see immediately, you know, he's going right back in there. That's where he's comfortable. That's where he wants to be. That's why this particular snake is on a different substrate. Uh, the other one was on paper. It's not a nervous animal. Uh, so it doesn't really need the added security that this provides. So it's kind of all about tailoring not only how we keep our animals, because a large part of taming animals down is having them be comfortable in their environment. When they're more comfortable in their environment, they're much more apt to tolerate handling because overall, they're a lot less stressed. Stressed animals are just way more likely to, uh, to bite in general. So you can see now with this snake, it's flattened out a little bit in its body. It's huffing a bit, which I don't know if you'll be able to really see, but this animal's more nervous than the last two were. So this is an animal we're gonna want kind of a quiet approach with, where we're not gonna come into its face, we're not gonna be threatening, because you can see already the animal's very stimulated and uh, very curious as to what's going on here. So we're gonna wanna approach this animal in a way that's not gonna make it feel like, you know, the threat level has increased and it needs to defend itself. So you can just start off with a gentle touch, let the snake know you're in here, let it know, you know, now we've done this a few times with this animal, so it's like, okay, you know, I'm probably gonna be handled now. Now it's not super happy about it, but you can see it's thinking, you can see the tongue flicks are going, it's processing information and figuring out, okay, I don't really necessarily need to bite here, but you can see it's still fidgety and still wants to get away from me. Borneo short tails especially are known for doing something called thrashing. When they get nervous, uh, they'll actually thrash their body back and forth and kind of look like a fish out of water. Uh, so it's important when working with these that you keep them over something uh, where they're not gonna fall and hurt themselves because they will, uh, they have no regard for their personal safety at all. Uh, when they get to that point where they're stressed and they're overloaded, they just kind of freak out. Um, and Borneo seem to do it more than the other short tail species. I find Sumatrans do it the least amount. Uh, blood pythons are somewhere in between. But you can see the snake is starting to process like, okay, I've been in this situation before and it's always worked out. So I'm weary and I'm nervous, but I'm not gonna overreact right now. And so that's the level that you wanna get to with them. And like I said, you know, you can start off where it's just, just gentle touching. And now that he's been out, he's gonna cruise. Uh, that's pretty typical with these guys. They like to move around. Uh, this is actually a snake that's spoken for and sold, but is still here at the time. But she's pretty cool. Uh, she's from an ocelot to ocelot pairing. Uh, so more than likely she carries genes in here to make ocelot. And the last baby I have is an ocelot. It's probably the most high strung uh, baby for this video. And so I'll show you another technique in working with that to where you, know, you can kind of help offset that to a certain extent. One thing that's a really big deal to me is um, I want my hands to be as positive experience always as possible. I don't want my hands to be a negative part of the experience. So if I have a snake that's extremely reactive and extremely defensive, then I don't wanna put my hands on that animal when it's nervous, because now it's gonna associate that nervous feeling with my hands. And so that's where this little hook comes in handy when you're dealing with one of these snakes that's more reactive um, in order to kind of bridge the gap before you touch it or even for a while for the first couple months if they're super reactive, 
I'll use the hook to kind of shoo them into another tub while I clean theirs back and forth. So any animosity or any bad feelings they have is for that and not associated with me. And then once I start seeing signs where the animal's more curious and less defensive, that's when I'll move to start touching with my hand and all that stuff. The biggest thing is there's no rush to do this. Take your time. Uh, a lot of people want the snake to be sitting on the couch with them in a week and some snakes just aren't gonna work like that. So the longer you put in with a nervous animal, the slower you move, the more you're gonna allow it to process that information and learn. Now with older animals, it can be different. Older animals, when you're hesitant, sometimes that'll throw them off and they'll feel like, okay, this person's not confident, something's up here, and they'll be more defensive. But with babies, typically a slower approach works better because they don't have any experience with anything, so everything is gonna be new to them. Uh, so they have to process whether this new experience is safe, whether it's an opportunity to get a meal, or whether they need to defend themselves at all costs. Uh, so this next baby is going to be the ocelot, and it went to the bathroom in here, so we'll clean that after. The snake likes to go to the bathroom a lot. Um, it has a tendency when I put it in a holding tub to go to the bathroom in the holding tub. But she is, is probably more reactive than the others. So when I touch her, you know, you can see she's already starting to move away from me uh, and, you know, try to figure out a way to get away and be squirmy. And she typically doesn't want to bite, but she can be very squirmy. And of course, she's going to be more cooperative than usual to make me look stupid on the video. Uh, that happens all the time. The snakes you say are going to be nice aren't nice. And then the snakes you say are going to be testy aren't. Uh, but you can start to see she's starting to flop her body a little bit around. Um, that's where you can see she's getting a little bit nervous, but she's assessing the situation. And now that she's getting older, she's starting to figure out like, okay, this isn't so terrible. But at some point, she'll probably get sick of me, and she probably will flop around a little bit. And these ocelots are really cool-looking snakes. And I apologize with the glare and everything if you're not getting a good look at them. Uh, let me see. You know what we'll do? We'll uh, switch around here a little bit so you can get a more, more natural view of this snake without all the uh, sunlight coming through. But you can just tell by her movements that she's still not 100% secure, but uh, she doesn't feel it necessary to, to thrash or anything. And her tongue flicks are actually slowing way down. Uh, they can though, just all of a sudden decide, you know, they're frustrated, you're restraining them too much, manipulating them too much, and then they'll throw that little fit. Uh, but these guys by and large are at a point now where I've handled them enough to where they're not like that. Um, but definitely slow and steady wins the race when it comes to, to taming hatchlings. And if you do have to use the hook, uh, you know, what I recommend, you don't want to just like directly pick them up with the hook because they're so floppy, but you can use it to kind of redirect them, you know, slide their bodies a little bit, just touch them and get them out of that situation where they start to say like, okay, nothing bad's happening. Uh, you redirect their body a little bit, or if I wanted to get her out of the tub, you know, you can give them a little a little nudge or whatever, get them on the run a bit. Um, and then, you know, you could even tip the tub to show her like, okay, this is the exit here. And then she'll start to come out on her own. Um, and you can get them out that way. And sometimes, you know, snakes that are nervous in their space, it's the transition that really gets to them. So sometimes getting them to come out on their own and letting it be their choice to crawl out onto your hand can help. Um, and you'll find yourself uh, having a snake that's less reactive to you invading their space because now they're coming out into the unknown. Uh, so they're not as apt to feel like they need to defend their space. Uh, so that's one, one trick that can really help for you. So hopefully you found this information useful and I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions that you may have. I wish I had some babies that were like unmanageable so I could show you that. Maybe next season we'll do like an updated version of this with some some babies that are striking and uh, you know really nervous. But the thing is, you look at this animal and a lot of people will think I've handled this animal a lot. This animal's probably been handled three or four times outside of cleaning, that's it. In a matter of you know several months since it hatched. That's all it takes. It doesn't take a lot. And these guys hatched really super small, so that's why you're thinking, oh, several months, that snake's tiny. Uh, they came out of like the smallest short tail eggs I've ever seen. So you don't have to put a lot of time into it in the beginning. If you want to kind of push things along, then a couple of times a week are okay in the beginning, but you always want to make sure you give them a day or two before you feed and then like three days after you feed, 
to kind of just chill and not have to have that stress. You know, you don't want that stress on them, making sure they're eating and that they're drinking and are established is much more important than making sure that they're easily handled. All right, uh, sorry about the length on this one, guys. We'll see you.